Good morning and welcome to Kensington. We're so glad that you're here with us today, whether that is in person or online. My name is Taylor Lee Allen. I am the Early Childhood Director at the Troy Campus. And yes, it is true. I have the best job in the entire church because I get to see the awe and wonder of our littlest people when they learn about Jesus and how he wants to be their friend forever. I'm sure this goes without saying, but parents, it literally does take a village, doesn't it? And honestly, it takes a mid-sized village to accomplish all the things we do in kids on a Sunday morning as well. There are small group leaders, early childhood teachers, elementary teachers, one-on-one buddies for children with special needs. We have a team who prepares crafts and games in our curriculum during the week and so much more. We would love, love, love to have you join this village or team that serves our next generation. It's really fun and fulfilling, guys. I can assure you of that. Listen to my friend Joshua from from our Birmingham campus as he shares his experience in volunteering with us in K-Kids. I always try to think of of what does a childlike faith look like, kind of what what God calls us to have is a childlike faith. And to see it firsthand, it's it's one of the most rewarding experiences. Going to church my entire life, never thought I would uh, do much more than sit in service, enjoy, and leave. And and I found such a a newfound joy uh, with interacting with the kids and seeing their faith develop, seeing their social interaction develop. Just watching the kids learn new songs, watching the kids interact with each other and kind of build new social circles within that, whether they go to different schools, whether they go to different areas, just seeing them form these new friendships and knowing that these are the type of friendships that you really want to foster long-term, uh, you're not worried. You know, it, whether it's just, these are not just church people that you're seeing, but it's something that you're encouraged to see, you know, my sons, my family grow within their church group uh, is extremely important and really dro- growing that community. I I think you never know who you're going to impact and you never know what kids 20 years from now are going to remember something that they were told uh, back at their Sunday school experience. So that really motivates me, but that also surprises me that something I might say one week, um, six months later, they might bring it up randomly and talk about how it applied to their lives. I think God has shown me personally that just to be a good listener, to be a patient and active listener, sometimes just letting kids talk, letting kids get out their version of how they interpreted a story, uh, is very exciting to see that. Like I said before, watching their faith develop, watching uh, the joy develop within them, um, it's something that you really can't find in any other any other volunteer activity, any other area than seeing it firsthand with kids uh, as they grow. It's been it's been extremely awesome that way. This is time uh, that becomes eternal. It's it's time that's that's fantastic and time that is not only personally rewarding uh, but eternally rewarding for those children uh, down the road. So I would I would just encourage anybody thinking about it uh, to jump into a role like this. Just show up, even if you don't think you have the talent, even if you don't have kids, you don't have the abilities. Just show up and be there for those kids. And that's something that uh, you truly will feel like you're doing God's work in that way. So don't dismiss yourself if you don't know the Bible that well, or if you can't sit cross-legged on the floor anymore, we get it. You have something unique and special to give, and you may impact a life or several eternally. This is such a privilege, so join us, join the K-Kids team. All you have to do is go to kensingtonchurch.org forward slash serve and search for opportunities at your specific campus. Okay, now back to our service. We are in week two of our series called Go, and today we're going to hear about this idea of church planning. It's something we're really passionate about because it's so important in spreading the good news of Jesus here and around the world. Are you ready? Let's go. Well, good morning, and welcome to everyone who's joining us online. My name is Shauna. I'm so glad that you have joined us here today at Kensington, and if it's your first time or if you are newer to Kensington, we would love the opportunity to be able to meet you, so I would encourage you to stop by the hub after service. The hub is located in the center of the lobby. You'll see some signs above it and some people wearing some orange shirts, and this is a place that we can meet you, but it's also a place for you to discover more about Kensington, so you can ask questions. You can find out about different ministries or events that are coming up and really find out how you can get connected into the community here at Kensington. Now, I got to tell you, one of the best ways to get connected is by jumping into one of our serving teams. And uh, that's a great place to find friends, just meet people and just really dive in a little deeper here at Kensington. And as that video talked about, 
We are looking for people to jump in and be a part of our K-Kids team. As we are approaching summer, we are looking for some more people that can come in and help. And I'm going to tell you, K-Kids is probably one of the funnest areas. So if you'd be at all interested or if you're interested in helping out in another area, please stop by the hub after services. We'd love for you to come be a part of one of our teams here at Kensington. Now, speaking of K-Kids, we are super excited that next month we are having VBS here at CT, and it is going to be an incredible week. So if you have kids, or if you have grandkids, or you know some kids in your neighborhood, mark this date down because we want them to come be a part of this incredible week. There's going to be fun music and games and activities, and best of all, our kids get to hear more about Jesus and how much he loves them. And so we would love for them to be a part of it, so mark that down and register will be opening up for that really soon. So you have joined us today for week two of our series called Go, and we are super thrilled. We have Drew Daniels with us today bringing the message, and he'll be sharing about church planting and what is that and why is it important? Why is it such a big part of who we are here at Kensington? We really believe that God is on the move, that he's an active God, that he's working in each one of our lives, but in our communities and across the globe. But not only is he on the move, but he's also inviting us to be a part of what he is doing. That we each have this opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We really believe that each one of us, we have the, the opportunities to make a difference while we are all still alive. And before we are covered in daisies. Told them your dreams and they all started laughing I guess you're out of your mind till it actually Told me I was out there, try to knock me down Took those sticks and stones, showed them I could build a house They tell me that I'm crazy, I'll never let them change me Till they cover me in daisies, daisies, daisies They said I'm going nowhere, try to count me out Took those sticks and stones, showed them I could build a house They tell me that I'm crazy, I'll never let them change me Till they cover me in daisies, daisies Did we put all our hopes in a box in the attic? Ooh, yeah, I'm a long shot. I'm the Hail Mary. Why can't it be me? You told me I was out there. Try to knock me down. Took those sticks and stones. Showed them I could build a house. They tell me that I'm crazy. But I never let them change me. Till they cover me in days. Daisies, daisies, they say I'm going nowhere, trying to count me out. I took those sticks and stones, showed them I could build a house. They tell me that I'm crazy, but I'll never let them change me. So they cover me in daisies, daisies, daisies. Come on, how about Katy Perry on a Sunday morning, anybody? 
Well, hey, welcome to Kensington. My name is Drew. I'm so thankful to be here with you. And for all of those of you who are joining us on the stream, so glad that you are with us as well. Well, hey, I love how Katy Perry, she says, why not me? And as Shauna said, I think all of us have this opportunity and this choice to do something with our life that truly matters. And I think one of my fears is, is that we believe that all the things that matter in this life, like growing God's church, for instance, like we're talking about today, is someone else's responsibility or even someone else's, you know, pleasure or job. But in the reality, I believe that it's actually growing God's church that is something he's inviting us into. And that's what we mean when we say, church planning. Because I mean, I mean, let's face it, not all of us are going to go and start a church or, or even join a church plan because you're like, wait, am I going to have to leave Kensington? I mean, not necessarily. And so you're probably sitting here wondering the question I just posed, which is, how does this even apply to me today? I mean, we're talking about planning churches. I mean, how does this matter to me? And before we answer that today, I want to just tell you and inform you of what church planning is in fact, Kensington, this is our heartbeat. I mean, we have helped uh, domestically launch over 80 churches and be a, a, be a part of launching 80 churches domestically, and then a part of 8,300 churches worldwide and are in the process of six uh, churches at the moment. So if you're not sure what it looks like and how we've been a part of it, why don't you go ahead and check out this video. So there's a term that gets used in the church world quite a bit called church planting. So I want to take a minute and I want to explain what church planting actually is. It is taking the mission and the message of Jesus to a new location with a group of followers of Jesus starting a new expression of a community of faith. So here's what I want to do. I want to take you back to where we start to see the first movement of church planting begin. In the Bible, in the book of John chapter 1, this is what it says in verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And then Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about the prophets and also Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is essentially where church planting started. And it's how every church plant starts. Every church plant is ultimately the beginning inception of an invitation to come and see and to follow. And then you bump over into the book of Acts, chapter 8, after Jesus has already ascended back to heaven, and you have the church undergoing some of its most intense persecution ever. And this is where church planning really begins to explode. In Acts 8, under the persecution of the Roman Empire, the church begins to scatter around the region. And everywhere the scattering church and Christians began to go, new expressions, new communities, new churches began to get planted. And here's what you may not realize. The only reason that Kensington exists is because we were a church plant. I was finishing seminary in uh, 1986, and the only job interview I got was with Wally Hostetter at Faith Church in Rochester. Wally, we were 250 people strong, and he goes, we're going to reach 10,000 people in Oakland County, like you and me. I'm like, okay. And he says, and part of it, we're going to do it. We're going to build faith church, but we're going to plant churches. Back then, people didn't start churches. Like if you, if you sent 30 or 40 people out from your church or 100 or five, everybody's like, wait a second, we're losing our people. And like Wally's like, no, this is the way we live. He says, you're going to be our first church plant. And that's how he hired me. So from the very first day of Kensington, one of the first messages in the first month that said, we're going to live open-handedly. It was late, kind of the mid to late 90s. I was getting up early in the morning, going to breakfast real early. I was just like, Lord, what do you, what do you want us to do? And that's where I felt as clear as day, where I felt I didn't hear an audible voice, but I felt like the Lord said, I want you to launch 40 multiplying churches by the year 2020 to reach 250,000 people. So where we are now, I'm sure we've had at least 40 of those churches multiply. And we've lost count, track of all the hundreds of churches we've coached that weren't official Kensington church starts. Also didn't think about the influence Kensington would have and say, Kensington is a church that gives itself away. So in 1990, Kensington was established, launched, planted. 
And from then until now, we've actually planted 80 other churches. Many of those churches have gone on to plant other churches. And even some of those churches have gone on to plant other churches. And in some of our estimates, we think it's fair to say that those churches together and combined have reached several hundred thousand people with the message and the hope of Jesus. That puts us at a total presently of 97 churches. So let me tell you about where we are right now. Presently, we have seven different partnerships in varying stages of the plant process. Some of them are in the early stages of assessment. Some of them are literally in the process of launching right now. Some of them are just a little bit post-launch where they've opened their doors and they've gone public. One of the things that's unique about the community we serve is we are in the heart of Sin City. We are, uh, our church is just off the Las Vegas Strip. Las Vegas is a place as you might imagine where a lot of people's jobs are uh, involved in kind of the sin industry and uh, where people move here because of addictions and this city feeds addictions. So there's just a lot of people who are very um, hurting, but pretty uh, challenging place to start a church. But man, what better place to start a church than the heart of Las Vegas. Hey, Kensington, my name is Clint Dupin. My name is Michael Dupin. And we are so thankful for you. Um, some of you know we launched, uh, or Kensington launched, a church plant in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. We're a little over three years old. It's incredible to see what God is doing here in the Bay Area. It's tough, it's hard. And that's why we're so thankful for you and thankful for your support. Yeah, there's so many of you that encourage us, continue to pray for us. Um, and we are really right now praying for a facility um, because we can't meet in schools anymore and we're in the parking lot of another church. And so you could join us in that prayer. But we do see God doing incredible things. Um, like he said, the new people that are coming in person joined in this online season and it's our first time getting to meet them face to face. Um, we had a baptism during COVID. We're getting ready to baptize a few more. And so we just see God at work in incredible ways and so we're so grateful for your support. So as a church planning director here at Kensington, I want to tell you why all of this matters and means so much to me. The first is honestly because you go back to Jesus and there was only ever two things that Jesus ever said he was going to build. One was eternity. It was literally when he said, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. That's for us later. But the other was the church and that's for us now. Like the only other thing but eternity that he ever talked about building was the thing that he asked us to be and to do in this world to continue the mission that he started. Even one of the last conversations I had was a guy that looked at me a few weeks before Easter and said, this is nonsense. There's no way a dead man would come back to life. And I remember him staying with us for the next couple of weeks and listening and asking questions and challenging. And on Easter morning, walking up to me, just eyes loaded with tears and just said, I get it. This is the method that Jesus gave his followers to bring his hope, to bring his mission, to bring his love to the world. We have all kinds of stories all the time. We've seen hundreds of people come to faith. Uh, the first was a pimp who eight years later, seven, eight years later, became a pastor and just moved to Denver to plant a new church. That's been pretty awesome. And we're just grateful for God doing that through us and for you guys helping to make that happen. One of the things that we do here at Easttown is Alpha, and um, it's it's awesome to watch people that have come through Alpha. Two weeks ago, we received this email, and it's a guy who walked into the Easttown doors um, almost a, over a year ago, a year and a half ago, and he went through Alpha, he chose to go through Alpha, and then just kind of fell off, like we didn't know really what happened to him. All of a sudden, two weeks ago, I get this email, wants to talk, and wants to take a step of baptism and explains um, his new life in Christ and how he's understanding it. So what marks a person that starts a church? I'll tell you what's the, what the mark is. They don't care what it costs. And they know that whatever they sacrifice, they're never getting back. It's not. It's for Jesus. And it's for people to know how much Jesus loves them. This weekend, Clint, Mike, and Dupin will be meeting with a group of people in San Ramon, California. And I've met a lot of those people who had no idea that Jesus loved them. And if they hadn't gone, who would have told? You go to Communitas in New York and you see these homeless people who came to Christ, and some of them after 30 years of drug addiction. How would they have known if Craig and Chris hadn't gone? It's the heart of the gospel where you, you give it all away, right? Jesus says if a seed remains alone, it does nothing. But if it goes into the ground and dies, it bears incredible fruit. So it's that giving away of everything that God has given us.
know, the, um, <laughs> you know, the one, um, the one reason why church planting matters to many of us sitting in this room and those of us watching online is the fact that Kensington Clinton Township is a church plant. Like this church, brick and mortar, you know, on Hall Road is here because a group of men and women and families decided to leave Kensington Troy and start to lead and to give and to serve to be able to create this building that we get to enjoy so comfortably and hear about God's love. And, and for people who maybe would never know to click our website or to see the big building on Hall Road and to stop in and hear the message of Jesus. Now, when it comes to um, church planting, I want to define this as God's growing of the church. And I believe that it's all of our responsibility as Jesus followers to help grow God's church. And what happens is there is two views that I believe we have of the church that if we, if we perceive the church through one of these two views, we will begin to interact with the church according to our views. The first view is that we can view the church as a business or we can view the church as a family. See, the, the goal of business and the goal of family, they're different. I mean, there's two different end goals. See, the goal of a business is to remove struggle from your life. It's to make life easier for a consumer, right? Like a business owner of a coffee shop, you know, examines a coffee shop or someone has to get out of their car to go inside and get coffee. And they go, you know, I want to remove the struggle. So I'm going to make a drive through so that you don't have to get out of your car to get caught, right? Making your life easier so that uh, you can live a better life and, and make things, you know, just more com convenient and comfortable. So, so the goal of business is to create comfort, right? To remove struggle. However, the goal of family is to fight for relationship. See, see the goal of family is about living to give, to love and to serve which requires something of us. It requires us to sacrifice something. In fact, we, I believe that God has set up the church using family language and that the church is meant to be a family and not a business. So like in the scriptures, he's always talking about sons and daughters. See, God did not send Jesus to die on the cross to redeem unto himself a workforce. God did not send Jesus to die on a cross to redeem unto himself employees to work for him. Jesus died on the cross to redeem unto himself sons and daughters. And they use the language like we are co-heirs, meaning that we, we receive an inheritance in the spiritual, spiritual blessings of Jesus. Like this is the, the family language that God uses because family will fight, give, love, serve, and sacrifice to reach even people who aren't in their personal family, but to create and make room for other family in their life, right? Like this is the nature of family. And my, and my fear is that we interact and perceive the church more like a business and not so much like a family. Can you imagine if we treated our family like a business? Here's, here's a story that happened to me. And can you imagine if we treated our family like a business? Now, um, my family, we actually went to a restaurant on vacation and they had this terrible fly problem. I hate flies because at the Daniels household, we have a fly problem. And anybody who has a fly problem knows it doesn't just happen overnight. Like, like they've been there and you got to like fly swat all of them until they're doom and they're dead. So for me, I have a lot of anger issues towards flies because I don't believe they have feelings, right? Like they don't care about my life. I don't care about theirs. We have a mutual understanding. So these flies are going, and I'm, I'm becoming triggered uh, you know, by these flies. And so for me, I don't, I don't like to disturb my environment or, you know, the, the, the atmosphere, the rest. I'm like, I'm enjoying myself. However, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I grabbed the waitress and said, hey, look, I, is there anything that we can do about these flies? I mean, the whole restaurant, I kid you not, the, the, the whole restaurant was not having a good experience. And for me, like I'm a big customer service guy. Like I noticed, like if you take care, like the customer's always right. So, so she goes, okay, let me check in the back, right? I'm going to go with my manager. And so I'm like, if I'm the manager of this place, like this is my urgent priority. Like I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm moving heaven and earth to make sure that these flies are gone. She goes back, she goes, ah, there's nothing I can do. Like he, there's nothing we have. I'm like, you don't have anything? Like you don't have like spray or like little things to put on. Like you have not, like fly. And I'm, I'm like, look, fly problems don't just appear overnight. 
Like, like, right, like you have a fly problem and this is like, de- de- demands your urgent attention. And I'm, I'm getting frustrated because they're getting so bad. And so I was like, is there anything you can do? And so she comes back, get this. And she hands me a fly swatter. <laughs> Unbelievable. I couldn't, ridiculous. I was, so, I was like, what, are you serious? So, so if I'm becoming petty and passive aggressive and I'm hitting these flies and doing a verbal kill count, oh, nine, 10. And I had it when I killed a fly on my cheeseburger. And I was like, that's it, we're going inside. Sure enough, I try to signal, say, hey, we're moving inside. Nobody's to be found. So we're moving our drinks and our burgers inside. Finally, I have to get with the host to tell them to bring their bill. We don't see our server. And then finally, they bring the check for 50 bucks. Totally not worth the service. Hated it, right? Now, can you imagine if I interacted with my family or my household the way I interact with the business? Like I walk through the door at the Daniels household and I go, hey, babe. What are you going to do about this fly problem we have? And then I sit down and I'm like, is someone going to bring me some water? Like the service here is unbelievable. And then she brings me food. I said no onions and no tomatoes. You know, I take this back. This is rubbish. What else can I order? She'd be like, the only thing I'm going to order you to do is sleep on the couch for the next five nights. I would say, yes, ma'am. See, you would never interact with your family the way you interact with the business because the the goal of family is sacrifice to to, to give and to serve because we love the result of what family brings when we do this, right? See, the natural outflow of family is to give up. Do do you have, do you you know what I did yesterday, by the way? Um, my, My wife got a Manny and Petty as a queen should. And while she was there, I had to watch my son. And so for, for a good amount of time, you know, I have really important things to do. Like I got I to gotta talk in front of all of y'all. And, and really, it's, it's pretty nerve wracking being up here. I know it doesn't seem like it, but I, I, I was up till 2 a.m. You're not supposed to know that. But the reason why I was up is because during my day, I'm making sure my one-year-old son's not falling off the couch. I'm changing his diaper. I'm singing him a song. I'm heating up his milk bottle. I made five chicken breasts for the family for the next few days. Because I love family, right? See, see, when we serve in family, we do it because we love the result of it. We don't mind giving up because we love what it brings. So guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to wake up. I'm going to walk my dog. I'm going to make chicken. I'm going to change diapers. I'm going to heat up bottles. And my son will never have to do anything until he's old enough to do tasks and chores. And I will so gladly repay him for my own childhood. But all of that to say... This is what family, this is the nature of family. See, serving and giving is a family issue, not a business issue. And my, uh, my fear is, is that we begin to treat the church from that place of comfort and convenience of like, how are you going to accomplish my Christian living for me? Like, what's the church doing to get, make community easier for me? What is the church doing to reach people? Because I don't know if I feel like, like that's the 501c3 church's job. But I believe that God has invited all of us to participate in family. In fact, Paul he ex- explains in Ephesians uh, chapter four that there's this thing called the fivefold ministry where there's these, the, the pastors, the preachers, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. He gives them these roles and they make up the, the leadership of the formal church. However, he says the goal of the formal leadership of the church, and he uses this language, is to equip the saints to do the work of the kingdom building. So the goal of the, the formal institution of the church is to equip the people in this room and watching on the stream, that it's our responsibility to grow God's church. Like this is a part of the, man, the mandate that God puts through the scriptures and Paul. Now, what happens is we can either become like Paul or Peter. See, these are two apostles and they actually have an encounter and a disagreement in the New Testament. And I'm gonna start with Paul and explain a little bit of his background and before, you know, before I have to even get into his background, I have to tell you some history to make sense of his background. So 600 to 800 years before Jesus walked the earth, there were two major invasions of God's chosen people, the Israelites. And in this, these invasions, they would take the Israelites captive and take them out of the zip code of Israel and hold them in prison and in slavery. The one more notable one is of the Babylonians, and the, and the Jewish people are in captivity so long, past the generation, that some of them don't even remember their homeland. And so when King Cyrus frees the Jewish people to go back to Israel, some people don't go back because they have no memory. And so they go 
dispersed throughout the Mediterranean world. This is called the diaspora, the dispersion of Jews in the Mediterranean world. But what they took with them is their cultural identity and their religious practices because that's what they had in captivity and amongst their people group. So the Jewish people of the first five books of the Bible would practice the sacrifices, circumcision, you know, the types of meals, obeying the law. They built synagogues. And, you know, even the Old Testament had a translation into the Greek language. I mean, so much happened over time. And so what would happen is, as they built these synagogues, neighboring countrymen and countrywomen would show up to hear about the Jewish God. I mean, people who had no cultural identity with Yahweh, the God of the Bible. I mean, they were pagan worshipers or they worshiped many gods, but yet they would find themselves in there. And these people, the Jewish called them Gentiles. The word Gentile simply means of the nations or the way that, you know, any country would call other people foreigners. This is the term the Jewish people use. It's like, oh, they're, they're Gentiles. They don't abide by our customs and traditions. And so, there was a lot of debate of, well, do these Gentiles, do they have to get circumcised and obey some of the same laws that we do? And what does that look like for them? And so when, when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, no, it's no longer by what you do, sacrifice, practice. It's all by my grace that gives you a relationship with God and not by your works. And so when Paul, who's this man who is uh, super Jewish and persecuted the church, meets Jesus and becomes converted to, to the religion of Christianity, and he begins to preach, no, it's Jesus that we're saved. The thing about Paul, who writes so much of the New Testament documents, the thing that we don't realize is, is that Paul was born and raised in the diaspora. Paul was from Asia Minor or Tarsus, which is not in the zip code of Israel. So Paul grew up with the religious customs of the Jews, but was surrounded by the Gentiles. So we have to wonder, I mean, why did God choose Paul to reach the Gentiles? And there's three reasons. The first of which is that Paul was a Roman citizen. I mean, at this point in the world, the Roman Empire had taken over the world. And so Paul, he had access because of his citizenship. The second one is that he was well-educated in the scriptures. He was training to become a religious leader. And so in this process, he was well-educated to talk with Jews, to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah, and to talk to Gentiles using their philosophers and, you know, foreign gods to convince them that Jesus was the Christ. And then thirdly, God chose Paul because of his training as a Pharisee or this religious leader, so that he would have access to all of the synagogues in the diaspora. And so Paul he, his mission is to create house churches and be a church planter in the Mediterranean world using the synagogue to reach Jews and then the Gentiles. Like this is his passion, his heart, is to grow God's church and to reach people who nobody else was reaching. And so here's what Paul says. He says in Romans chapter 10, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Not anymore. I mean, it's all covered through Jesus. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, this everyone isn't just individuals. I mean, it's, it's people groups. It's Jews, Gentiles, Greeks, slaves, free. He continues on. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've never heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent to go and grow God's church? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. I believe that what Paul is mentioning and talking about is our invitation into growing God's church. I believe that God wants us to reach people that no one's reaching. How are they supposed to know unless people are sent and to go help grow God's church? God has sent us to reach people that no one is reaching. And I think the problem is we see growing the church as the church's job, not necessarily our job. Like it's easy, right? It's like, oh, like Kensington, they're so good at church planting. But like, what about me? I mean, I know I have an office and I could maybe help grow or reach people there. But, but man, I feel like that's more the church. I mean, that's why they build those build big buildings, right? See, see, see here, here's what it's like if we think um, 
you know, it's, it's, some, it's someone else's job to, to grow the church or, or the church's job, right? So my wife and I, we uh, got a puppy two, two years ago. His name's Moose. He's a lab. Um, th- apparently, they like to eat, eat everything. Any dog owners in the house? So you know. Oh, I didn't because I never had a dog in my whole life. See, I, I never had a dog. So my impression of my thought was that my wife would do all the dog training because, you know, she's like, she's an animal whisperer. She, she says that her job in heaven is going to be to tend to the animals, right? Like this is her passion. Her passion is for, for animals and dogs. And so the, the problem with Moose is that he was terrible at walking, right? Bad walker, walked in zigzags. You didn't have to choke him, act like you were, he was standing by your side as is customary with dogs. So, so, so when I'm walking him, my wife would look at me and she goes, tell Moose to heal and then grab his chain. I was like, well, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not the one who has a walking problem. Talk to Moose. He, he can't walk. And then, and then she'd, uh, you know, he'd bite guests as they do. And she'd be like, so, so, so Drew, when, when Moose is biting, you have to say no biting and you'll grab his mouth. I'm like, look, I don't have the biting problem. Tell Moose that. See, I, I don't even know this. Even if you go to a dog training class, the trainers will not teach your dog how to be better. They will tell you how to make your dog better, right? Like the, it's their job to equip you so that you can train your dog. And I think this is a welcome to the church moment. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're telling me I got to grow my faith? Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. But, but I thought that was your job. I mean, my, my faith's the problem. Why aren't you growing it? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm supposed to grow God's church and reach people? No, I mean, wait, that's your job. Why are you telling me I got to do that? See, this is Ephesians 4. The role of the church is for us to come together and for us in the room, including myself, to be equipped to do the work of growing God's church. So what happens is if we don't maybe look like a Paul who's advocating to reach people no one's reaching, we may look like Peter. See, see Peter, um, he actually had a direct challenge from Jesus that he would be the, the church builder. This is what we read in P- Jesus and Peter's conversation. Jesus asked Peter, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. See, see the church is Jesus' mandated vehicle to defeat darkness in the world. And he tells Peter that you are going to be the backbone. And of course, Peter shows up on the day of Pentecost in this famous sermon, you know, taking it, taking it to contemporary times. It probably looked a little bit like this where, where Peter was giving this message and at the end, he began to speak in a whisper and he got down on one knee, you know, and very just said, do you want to believe in Jesus, Lord? I just want you to raise your hand. Yep, thank you in the back. I appreciate it. Yep, down front. Thanks so much. Well, hands up all over this place. Wow, amazing, you know. And then he says, it says in the Bible, you know, 3,000 people were saved. It's like, is that a pastor number? It's like, you just seen a 3,000 people got saved. I mean, it was the Bible. So we trust the Bible and it said, you know, so 3,000 people, wow. I mean, that's like bigger than the size of Clinton Township. If all of our services, you know, kind of go accordingly. I mean, this is a huge move of God. And, and you know, God builds it on the back of Peter. However, some years later, Peter needs to be corrected in something. Peter begins to make a misjudgment and begins to stay in his comfort zone instead of reaching people who, who, who no one else is reaching. See, see, this is where Paul, he comes and confronts Peter because Peter is more comfortable eating with other Jewish people. This would be like us as Christians, where it's like we have so many people maybe in this room or in our neighborhood who don't know Jesus, who are hurting in a broken world. And, and we're going to sit over, you know, with the, the matriarchs and the patriarchs of the church you know, the people who wear all the, you know, the suits and love the pie fellowships. And we're going to sit back and we're going to say, you know what, we want, we want the meat of God's word, not just the milk. I mean, what, what is God saying in the scripture? I mean, where is it in the text? And yet all these other people are kind of sitting here being like, I don't even know what the text is. Like, I've never read the text. And so, but we're like, yeah, yeah, okay, well, you'll learn someday. But I, I really want to focus over here on, you know, what God's word is telling me, right? And so Peter's doing this with his boys who are all about circumcision and the Jewish customs. And in the process, what happens is, some of the other Jews begin to stop sitting with the Gentiles at, di- at, at, at mealtime, which is a sign of who you associate as and with. And they left to go join what was comfortable with Peter because of Peter's betrayal. So Paul, this is his confrontation. He says this, Paul's speaking here. He says, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. Strong words, bro. He says this, 
for what he did was very wrong. Dang, calling him on the carpet. He says, when he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. (gasps) But afterward, when some friends of James came, you know, James, you know how he is. Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. Man, you kind of strange. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. See, I think as, I think as Jesus followers, if Peter represents maybe in, in this example, the church, I think the church needs to be corrected because it's so easy to just stay with people who think exactly like us who agree with our standpoints on things, who, who like our, you know, Facebook posts, right? Like, like it's so easy to just to stay with these people because we find belonging and meaning. And that's good. It's, and you know, it's good to be obsessed about what the Bible says and what it means. But do you know what the irony is? The Bible itself is a bunch of letters to church planners who are actually doing the mission of God. Like literally, Galatians, Ephesians, Corinthians, all the ends you can think of. All of these letters are to people in Gentile territory and their instruction manuals about how to manage and reach people that God isn't reaching. Like the whole point of the Bible and what it was written for was to reach people. To not have to be like, no, you don't gotta stay in your works or your religious customs. No, no, no. It's about grace and who Jesus is and to reach people who, who, have, who would have no clue. Do, do you wanna know what it looks like when, when we begin to, to stay in comfort instead of, you know, sacrificing it for the cause of family. This is, this is a real story where, you know, I think this, this applies. So my wife and I, we moved about two years ago. I hate moving. I, I, I dread it. Um, but as we moved, um, I had to go to Home Depot. I don't know if you know, I do not belong in Home Depot. <laughs> like, like they smell me from miles away. They're like, okay, this is what we're working with. And so I, I walk in. See, the thing about Home Depot though, is that like, you kind of have to, as a guy, you have to act like you know what you're doing, you know? You got to pretend a little bit, kind of do, like you can't reveal too much like you don't know because they'll smell you out from a mile away. And so like I, I walk in and I'm kind of doing this thing, you know, I'm playing my cards right. I see these two employees talking to themselves. You know, I'm, I'm a new dad, but they were deep in like dad land, you know, d- talking about things I have no idea. They're like, oh yeah, that's probably made out of some oak. And the guy's like, yeah, spruce. I'm like, totally guys, you know, like, yeah. Did you put a nice finish on there? Like, yeah, cool, man. And, and they're talking and they're having this conversation. And I'm trying to do the, the lost puppy eye thing, but, but play it cool. But I'm like, man, they're not noticing me. And I'm still kind of just playing it cool. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to find the type of paint I need. See, see, I was looking for some, 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 uh, some cabinet paint, right? I didn't know there were different types. So, so I, walk, and I was like, hey, uh, you know, what type of paint do you guys use when you're in cabinets? And the guy goes, oh, Alkid. And I was like, dude, you use that stuff? Okay. All right, show me where it's at, big man, you know? And, and he goes, oh, yeah. And this is what he goes. He goes, yeah. Uh, and he just points. He goes, yeah, it's... Um, just in the next style. I kid you not, a guy who's been working at Home Depot for 23 years called me after service and he goes, oh yeah, that's called the point and shoot. We never point and shoot. But he just goes, yeah, uh, it's, just, it's just, uh, just, just points. And he goes, it's that way. And I goes, yeah, uh, just that way. He goes, yep. And I was like, okay. So I took my cart and sure enough, I, I go down the paint aisle. Wouldn't you know, all the cans look exactly the same. Like, wouldn't you think they'd gra- graphic design them differently? So I couldn't find them. So sure enough, I was like, dang it, I'm gonna look like an idiot. But I show it back to these two guys and they're still talking and I'm kind of like clearly hovering and I'm like, hey, look, I don't mean to be an interruption, but I don't know, I couldn't find that good. And the guy, again, he just goes, oh yeah. Um, and he just points, he goes, yep, just, it's right over there. And I was like, look, I, I don't know where that is. And he goes, I was like, can you show me? And he goes, yeah, sure. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I apologize. I was like, I'm so sorry. And he goes, yeah, 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 yeah there's no problem. I'm like, hmm, clearly it is. Clearly it's a problem. <laughs> sure enough, we round the corner and uh, he goes, yep, right up here. And I was like, I just help. And he goes, okay. And he walks up and he, he takes the paint can off, off the shelf. See, I think my fear is, is in a broken world, people will come into the church or around Christians and be like, I have so much anxiety and depression and I'm looking to belong somewhere. I'm looking to be included and loved. Is there any way that you have hope for me? And we're just kind of like, uh, uh, yeah, so Ken, uh, Kensington, they meet down there. Or someone's like, I, I heard about Jesus, but my, my, my perception of him as I grew up was that he was mean and evil and that he was wanting to punish me. Like, do you know anything about the, Jesus being gracious? Like, I don't know. And we're like, um, I think the prayer team, they meet at the hub. 
You see, in this world, I don't think we need more people who are just going to point out the problems or point to where to get fixed. We need to take people by the hand and lead them to the person of Jesus who can redeem lives, who can restore lives, who can offer hope, who is the way and the truth and the life. Come on, do you believe in here today that he is the healer, the author of our transformation? And in the process, what we do is we just think it's somebody else's job. Welcome to the church. See, the moment we think it's our responsibility to see people, see, see what happens is we're kind of like these two like employees sitting here talking about what type of service, contemporary, worship, old school. How about the new perspective on Paul? What about Calvinism? We're sitting over here, we're like talking about these things. And there's people who are just like, I have no idea what any of that means. I'm just looking for Jesus. <laughs> and we're sitting over here being like, just, just in our own world and being like Peter, comfortable talking with people who think like us and know the things that we do. But in the process, see, family will live, love, and give to serve. It gives away, it sacrifices. See, I believe we're only as rich as our relationships. Our life will only be as rich as the relationships we fought for in our lives. The level of intimacy is the level and the quality of, I believe, of the richness of our life. And so if we're sitting over here only focusing here, but we're not willing to have the exciting adventure and experience of leading people to the discovery or the, a breakthrough moment with God, then we may be missing out. And there's a reason why we're bored at church. There's a re- like, because we've treated it like a business. What are you going to do to make community easy for me? What are you going to do? To make it interesting. I mean, it's just like, man, we love Craig Mays. Like, who's this guy up here, right? But see, a family goes, no, no, no. I want to contribute because I love the outcome that that, that serving is. It's family. It's family relationships. It's bringing people from death to life. And so, so, so you might be wondering, well, how in the world do I contribute, help, grow? Maybe you're feeling convicted right now. And and I would say, even if you can't take a step now, here's one opportunity, which I'm going to pause to receive our offering for the day. If you're a guest with us, hey, there's no pressure in this moment. But if you are a part of Kensington and you call this place your family and you're looking for an easy next step and clear way to give, this is an easy one. You can give in three ways um, by texting the word Kensington to the 77977. You also have touchless buckets on the way out in the lobby that you can drop, you know, money or checks into. And then also we have an app um, that you can download. And, And honestly, like, Again, if you're like struggling because you're like, I don't know if I have time in the season of life, things are picking back up. If you feel like God has richly blessed you, even if it's just like the widow with two coins and it's like, uh, but out of your little, you gave much. It's like the outflow of that is for family. It's to contribute, to give and to love and to serve. And so practically speaking, how in the world do we reach people that no one else is reaching? I mean, what what do we do? And here's here's my, my, my my one part of advice accommodate to your audience. Who is your audience? Who are you speaking to? And accommodate for them. Because this is what we see Paul do, who, who has a heart to reach people no one's reaching, right? In fact, this is how he talks about it in the scripture. He says this, though I am free and belong to nobody, I have made myself a slave to everybody to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one who is under the law. Verse 21, he says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. So as to win those who are not having the law. Verse 22, to the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. And I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. See, if you want to be like Paul, We need to learn to adjust our approach to be able to meet people with where they are and not where we would prefer them to be. See, it's easy to be like, no, I want you to just like know Jesus and know everything I know so that I can accept. No, no, no. We need to meet them with what they understand, which means not judging them, not shaming them, not condemning them. See, like, see, here's the thing about family. The reason why, like even in here, like we do family, we put greeters and signs out. Do you want to know why? It's because nobody in a a household, you're going to knock on it. When you have family, we're going to lead you around the house and make sure that you feel comfortable. 
We're going we're gonna to adjust our schedule to make sure that you feel right at home so that your heart can be disarmed. That's why Kensington for years would do humor and fun to disarm people away from the shame or the irrelevance of God. This is purely biblical, in my opinion. In fact, Paul says in the same chapter, he adjusts his approach twice. Acts chapter 17, he runs into a people group called the Bereans. And the Bereans were known for men, being men of noble character. And Paul searched through the scriptures to convince them that Jesus was Lord. What does this mean? That they were kind of Christian-y in their language. So, so like meaning if we're trying to convince our, our, our Jesus following brothers and sisters that it's, it's important for us to grow God's church, we can use the Bible. We can talk all, of, all day about what God thinks in, inside the scriptures. But then he goes to Athens, Paul goes to Athens, and they're pagan worshipers. They worship many gods. In fact, he kind of Lingu- reasons with it. He says, to an unknown God, ooh, mysterious. He never uses even the word Jesus. In fact, he quotes their philosophers. Have you ever quoted Katy Perry to someone who needs to know Jesus? See, this is the reason why in Asian 29, I quote Lil Wayne and Drake. I'm accommodating to my audience to speak in a language that they would understand just so that I might win some. See, I believe that in order to reach people who no one's reaching, we need to do things that no one's doing. Because if we were, if, if you know, if the, the, the things that people were doing clearly haven't reached them, so why am I going to continue to do the same things? So I need to do things that nobody's doing. I need to meet them on their turf. Why am I expecting them to jump to my turf? I mean, they, they haven't agreed to any of this. So that's why when people say, oh, well, the Bible says, and God's word is clear. And they're like, I don't even hold to the authority of the Bible. Why am I going to listen to you? I think it's so important to adjust and accommodate to our audience so that we might reach some to do things that no one else is doing. This has always been Kensington's heart. That's why I love this place. See, Kensington has, like, like Steve Andrews' heart has always just been give it away. Like no church does that. And in the process, we've formed local and global partners that are actually starting churches. In fact, one of our criteria is they need to be multiplying to grow God's church. Because it's not enough just to sit around in our comfort zone and instead to reach people who no one else is reaching. In fact, one of our new uh, global partners is called the Timothy Initiative. We're actually partnering with a few other churches in the area. And this is unlike our other partners with a point person. In fact, it's an organization that's on the ground. See, India is primarily Hindu and they belong in a caste system. So their way of life and thinking is different. And to expose them to the love of Jesus is life-changing. Here's actually a video about the Timothy Initiative if you're interested in learning more about it. Check it out. Hey, Kensington. Hey, so back in December, we all learned about our newest global partner, the Timothy Initiative in Northern India. Now, this partner is a little bit different than our other 10 partners because with our other partners, there's both a specific location and a specific point person. For example, in Kenya, it's Julius. In India, it's Jaya. In Nepal, it's Ramesh and, and so on and so forth. But with this new relationship being formed, it's more with a partnership with an organization. I can tell you in all honesty, we are thrilled about the partnership with the Timothy the initiative. They are passionate about spreading the good news of Jesus through discipleship making and church planning, which for me being the church planning director here makes me even more excited about it. So I want to do my best in the next minute to tell you though what that means. So let me start with a disciple. A disciple is simply a student. It's a learner of a teacher, a leader, a, of a philosopher. And so in this case, it's somebody who's learning the teachings and the practices of Jesus. But they're not only learning the ways of Jesus, they're actually living them out. But it doesn't end there because as they start living them out and the learnings that they're taking into their own life and they become more like Jesus, they also then move towards planting churches. Now, you might hear that phrase a couple of times around here, both in general and certainly during this series. Church planting simply means starting a church. When a seed's planted in the ground, over time, we know this, it becomes a plant. It's the same thing for a church. A few disciples plant a church, and then over time, God grows that seed into his church that becomes a place of hope, love, healing in that community. That's why we believe church planting is so vitally important. With the Timothy Initiative, you're going to hear three names from the Bible, Paul, Timothy, and Titus. And I'm going to make an assumption that probably a lot of us have heard about Paul or St. Paul. He's credited with writing 13 books in the New Testament and frankly, planning most of the churches that we read about. But then there's Timothy and Titus as well. These are guys that spent years with Paul. They learned the ways of Jesus through Paul's teachings and through his lifestyle as well. 
And then they traveled with them to all kinds of places throughout the region and together started churches. They were disciples and they were church planners. So right now we're gonna hear a story that frankly is like thousands of others, but it's a story of someone that's discovered a relationship with Jesus because of the work that God is doing through our newest global partner. My name is Jatinder Kumar and I come from a Hindu family who strictly followed our forefathers' traditions and rituals. I lost my father at a young age and was affected deeply by the sudden loss. I was depressed, lost and angry. Soon after, my mother became sick. I took her to different hospitals for treatment, visited temples, offered sacrifices and prayers, but her condition remained the same. I became frustrated and did not understand why this was happening. Things in my home were also bad. My house was in chaos. My brothers were alcoholics and there was no peace in the home ever. To get some peace for myself, I started drinking. The drinking became more frequent and then a regular part of my life. It was out of control. I'm a barber by profession but I spent half of my earnings on alcohol and this affected the economic condition of the house. There was no hope. One day, Vishal John went to my shop for a haircut. Vishal noticed that I was very upset and gloomy and upon asking me the reason, I told Vishal everything that happened and what I was going through. After hearing my story, Vishal grabbed the opportunity and shared his story, followed by God's story and invited me to church. I was afraid and uncertain of his church community, so I did not go. But some days later, Vishal met me again and told me that the whole church family was praying for me. I wasn't sure what this meant, but I was moved by their concern for me and my family. One day, I decided to visit the church. I was very nervous and not sure what to expect. During the church service, I began to feel a sense of peace that I have never had before. Slowly, my mother's condition began improving and I was convinced that Jesus alone is the true God. Two weeks later, I prayed to Jesus and said I was sorry for all that I had done and accepted him as my personal saviour. After years of remorse, I came to Jesus for deliverance. Jesus truly set me free, gave me a purpose for living, and even healed my mother after 10 years. I was so grateful. I am growing in my faith by regularly attending church services and meeting with other believers in Jesus. Today, I accompany Vishal and share my story with as many people as possible. I pray that they find the one true God, Jesus Christ, just as I have. So the Timothy Initiative's goal is to plant 3,333 churches. In fact, in the next couple of weeks, Kenzie is going to kind of unveil how even we can help plant churches all by ourselves. In fact, you can, in the future, you can actually plant a church for $300 and start a house church in India all by yourself. See, this is the opportunity that we get to be a part of. It's like, even if we are still wrestling with God to figure out what our story is and how we are going to enter into it and how we are going to serve and create family and welcome them in, is that we get to partner with organizations that are multiplying churches and changing lives for the gospel to reach people who nobody else is reaching. And this has always been our heart. And so my question for you is, are you going to live a life that matters? And are you going to give and serve and sacrifice for the sake of creating family and abandon your comfort? What story do you want to tell? So we introduced this song um, this past Wednesday at midweek. And as we were planning this service, 
just understanding that we're talking about planting churches. We thought it would be the perfect song um, to sing today. And um, this song is, is beautiful because maybe you heard Drew and Shauna talking about earlier where they were saying there's something that you can do today, something that you're able to do. And maybe you're asking that question, well, what is it that I can contribute? What is it that I can do to really be a part of this whole church planning initiative? And I think this song is a true example of that. It's called The Story I'll Tell. And the picture that it paints is that I understand that every moment is not going to be great. I understand that there will be hard times and there will be things that I go through. But once I have an encounter and an experience with God, it's something that I can't keep to myself. It's something that I have to share with the people around me. And so even if you don't have the finances or, or the resources, the first thing that you can do is share the story of God impacting your own life. And I pray that maybe if you haven't experienced that, that that would be something that God would start working on right now. That it would start working on your heart and allowing you to have an encounter with him. And so I pray that you listen to these words and that you allow them to bless you.
my God will not fail. Oh, 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 it's a story I'll tell. No matter what season I'm going through, oh, 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 oh I know it is well. Yes, we're singing. God, we trust that you are faithful, that if we step out away from comfort, that we'll be able to see the seeds that you part. We'll be able to see the bravery that we exhibited and you showed up. We'll be able to find ourselves in you. We'll be able to, to heal by stepping out in our acts of bravery and courage, God, that this is the story we'll be able to tell when we abandon comfort for the sake of sacrificing is that God, we don't wanna just be comfortable, we wanna be alive and we wanna experience the richness of your adventure. Lord, help us sing this song, that it'll be the story of our lives that you did what you said you, would go, you were going to do. Father, we thank you in your name, amen. Well, hey, I, maybe in here to, to this morning, you felt convicted, you felt challenged, you maybe had some, some your, there, there's stuff in your life where you're transitioning and there's so much uncertainty, we have prayer. Um, available to you that's out in the back. Um, and, and additionally, if you're a guest here and maybe you're like, wow, I, I wanna be a part of this family thing called the church and you're, you feel like you're just a guest in the house, man, we would love to invite you to the hub as all of us really are guests in this house and have a conversation with somebody as to how to make a big place feel small. Thanks so much everybody for coming out this week and we will see you back next week for another series, a week in our series go. Take care, everybody.